Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 60. Oh God, the big 6-0. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, not only are we into a new decade, you know, episode 60 of the Retro Hour podcast. Who'd have thought we'd have made it this long? Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> like, I can't believe that we've not missed a week. Yeah. <laughs> 60 weeks, dude. And we've had amazing guests every single week on the oh, show. Oh, yeah. We continue to bring you the biggest guests in the world of retro and gaming. I mean, it stuns me the, the, p- the caliber of people we get on the show. Yeah, it's totally crazy. I can't believe who we get on. And this week is no different. We've got, you know, co creator of probably the biggest selling PC game for about 10 years. I'd say this game. I mean, there are very few games that you could like kind of chart back in history that kind of defined an era. And actually, I think it's when you get a game that makes people go out and actually buy hardware to play that game. That's when you know it's a phenomenon. Totally. A killer app that makes people buy technology. And that was Myst. If you remember the world of Myst and Riven, it was just absolutely fantastic. And it's Rob Miller who's on today. He's quit gaming after Riven to do film directing, but he's back with some exciting news, guys. Yeah, actually, when did Riven come out? Like, 97? Around then. So he he quit after that game, the gaming industry, went into film directing and stuff recently, but now he feels the time is right to come back to gaming, and there's a very special reason why. So he's going to tell us all about this, and also, I mean, you remember, do you remember the first time we saw Mist? I couldn't believe it. I I actually saw it in a shop, and, you know, I'd hardly heard of CD-ROMs or seen what they were, but then this was the first time that I really felt I was in a virtual world. And I had before with, like, you know, isometric stuff and stuff like that, wireframe, but this was fully rendered, and you could see a C, there was a draw distance. (laughs) I'd never seen that before. I mean, it, it was just graphically my jaw dropped. I didn't think computer graphics could get that good. Yeah, yeah. I, I look at it now and I think, oh, that's a bit jaggy and yeah, horrible. Yeah. But then to me, it was bang, photorealistic, <laughs> you know. Well, you look at really defined two things. It was the start of CD-ROM. You, I mean, before that, games had to fit on like a one megabyte floppy disk. Yeah. And also, it was really the start of 3D as well. You know, obviously, the PlayStation had to come along after that. But this was there right at the beginning of the 3D And, and kind of logic puzzle games as well, because a lot of the games before were like card games or solitaire and stuff like this and this was a real logic puzzle based game i'd walk around in mist just like you know stuck in a puzzle for like three days but it's yeah. like you didn't care because it looks so nice it's well i'll just look at the pictures then you know maybe yeah nice. i'll just go for a wonder <laughs> down here so uh, robin miller is going to be on the retro hour in around 20 minutes from now get the inside story on the development of mist really interesting show this week definitely worth hanging around for that and of course the retro hour would not be possible without our favourite people in the world, the people who make the Hall of Fame every oh, single week. Our wonderful donators. Yes, thank you so much, guys. You know, 60 episodes and we've had some great donations and this has just really helped us kind of keep a momentum. And it helps us pay for the show. I mean, obviously, you know, server costs and all that. We say SoundCloud premium subscription and all that, you know. Not paying for the show out of our own pocket is a bit of a bonus. So it's, Yeah, you know, definitely. It <laughs> makes it a lot less effort. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for all your support so far, guys. And this week... Making the Hall of Fame, uh, thank you, Christopher McGonagall. Jonathan Moore. Stuart Thomas. Alistair Stevenson. Who've all made donations through our website at theretrohour.com. If you'd like to do the same, all you've got to do, pop onto our website, little PayPal link there, at theretrohour.com. Right then, before we get into our amazing interview with Robin Miller, should we get into a bit of the headlines from this week? Yeah, definitely. And we've got quite a bit of a revival going on this week. So Two massive ones, actually. Two, two massive ones. So you remember that? 80s electric vehicle made by Clive Sinclair, the C5. Sinclair C5, which, you know, in terms of, like, technological disasters, that's got to be up there in the top five. Yeah, so if you don't know what we're on about, it was kind of like a plastic triangle (laughs) that had a tricycle that had... um, a little battery-powered engine in there, wasn't it? Electric one. Yeah, you pedal for a certain amount, and then I think you could kick like the battery in. It'd take over for a bit, as long as you weren't on a hill. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> and they were designed to be, you know, the the new future technology. But this was in the eighties, so it kind of didn't work properly. Um, people would be riding on the road, and there'd be a big exhaust pipe from a lorry straight in their mouth. You know, it wasn't it's, very safe. It's like a flag on the back. I think, like you know, some legislation meant that it was like the wrong height or something. It, you know, it was a complete disaster. But, you know, the original C5, now I think it's become a bit of an icon, hasn't it? I mean, it is kind of, it's it's a disaster, so people laugh at it. Yeah. But really, I mean, it was, you know, technologically, I know it didn't work properly and everything, but electronic vehicles, an electric vehicle back in the early 80s was pretty far ahead of the time. Definitely, and it might be coming back here. So we have 
Grant Sinclair, who is actually the nephew of Clive Sinclair. So it's still within the Sinclair family. Wow. They're still creating C5s. He hasn't learned the lesson off his granddad or whatever. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> he's, he's just trying to improve it. Um, but this one looks really mad. It's going to sell for £3,500. Right. And it's going to be four times faster than the C5, which is a big relief for people. What's that, about four miles an hour then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also got mod cons, so it's got, you know... LCD headlights, and you can have a little camera uh, on your phone, so you can stream to your phone and use that as a real rear view mirror. Right, know? okay, that's pretty cool. But the problem with this is because of the speed, now you need to pay road tax and you need to pay insurance, and it's counted as a road vehicle where before the C5 was just, you know, kind of like a bike. Yeah, because you could pedal it, it was exempt, yeah. wasn't it? But the thing about this, I mean, it's called the Iris e trike. This one, it's a bit different to a C5 in, in that you've actually got like a cover that goes over you. So, I mean, if it's raining, you're not going to get wet. Yeah, and there's exhaust pipes on <laughs> going to your mouth. I mean, it does look quite futuristic. It looks a bit like something out of Tron. You know, like kind of retro futuristic, doesn't it, a bit, I suppose? Yeah, yeah. The thing about it is that the original C5 was at 399 quid. And I guess the reason that they, you know, invented that was kind of a cheaper way than having a car. But, I mean, you're talking this for a bike, you know. 3500 is pretty pricey, I think. If this was released at like 999 yeah, I think it would take off. Yeah. But well, that, well he's, he's got little mock-ups here of kind of, you know, it being used for paramedics and different kind of, uh, you know, emergency services. So I think he may be wanting to do a deal where the council buy it or some kind of group buys a big order. I don't, I don't really see this being much of a hit, though, to be honest. Well, I mean, I think, you know, having the legacy of the C5 behind it probably means a lot of people won't take it seriously, you know, if anything, you know, even though it's cool for us, it's only going to get ridiculed by the mainstream. Yeah, maybe if it had the that. Tesla name on it. Yeah, if Tesla made this, it probably would. But then, you know, he's actually said, you know, Grant Sinclair, he said... The reason that the C5 failed is it was just ahead of its time. Mm. And now cities have got, you know, cycle lanes. Um, we're all concerned about the environment a lot more than we were in the 80s now. And uh, this one will actually go. I mean, it's weatherproof and it goes up to 30 miles an hour. So, I mean, you know, if you're driving around cities, that's like the legal road limit, isn't it? 30 miles an hour. Yeah, that's quite fast, actually. <laughs> yeah, so, and it can it can do 31 miles, apparently, on the motor. So Well, maybe the first generation might not be the most popular ones, but, you know, maybe it's something that they could build on. Like, you know, segways have been used a lot by police and kind of mall cops. So, mm. you know, this could be used by other services, I guess. I think it's cool that he's uh, kind of, you know, stepping in Clive's footsteps though and doing, you know, he obviously respects his, his relatives. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like. This has been planned for years, hasn't it? I see, you know, Clive, Since he was a kid. Whenever I see Clive these days, he's got like a really hot wife, hasn't he? <laughs> I don't know that. I think he's like some ex-model or something like that. Nice. Google Clive Sinclair's wife. <laughs> All right, let's have a look. Okay, Clive Sinclair's wife. <laughs> I just have to show Revy. Oh, wow. Yeah, La really? Lady Sinclair. Lady Sinclair. Wow, she's, yeah, very pretty. <laughs> he's, he's done well there, Okay, Clive. now, I've just Googled it, and uh, I am right. I didn't want to say this in case I was wrong. She's a former lap dancer. Oh, okay. And she's 33. So wow. uh, you can see why Clive's not, um, you know, inventing too much these days. He's a bit busy. Yeah, he's a bit busy. He hasn't <laughs> come on the show. So. <laughs> so, you know, we'll keep you up to date with this uh, new Sinclair e-bike. You know, it's pretty cool, I guess, you know, especially for us retro guys having that. I mean, you should probably go and buy one this time around, you know. And keep yeah, yeah, we should years. spend all the donations on an e-bike. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not quite a three and a half thousand quid yet, I'm no, just saying. No. <laughs> probably like, these guys are rolling in it. Yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of that blast from the past, you mentioned that there have been two big comebacks this week. And who'd have thought this was going to make a return after 17 years? This has been everywhere. Top trending subject on Facebook over the weekend. The Nokia 3310 is back. Kind of. Kind of, yeah. You did a little video on it, didn't you, Dan? Yeah. Before, well, I did a video on YouTube about two weeks ago before they actually revealed what the spec of it was going to be. Ah. I just read that it was going to come back. I mean, I initially assumed they were just going to relaunch it as it was. Yeah, yeah. But they seem to have added like loads of little stuff like an internet browser. And, you know, it's got a full colour screen and all of this kind of stuff. So it really is not the Nokia <laughs> coming back. It's also got a quite slim case. I'd say the only similarity with it is the design and the stupidly long battery power. Yeah. Well, essentially, it's a crap Android phone, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> That's it's it. it is. The keypad, though, is off the original Nokia 3310. That's about the only bit of it that really is the same as the original. Apparently, the keys feel very similar. And it's got, is it, you know, T9 predictive text that uses okay, that? Okay, yeah. So... Yeah. Well, I don't understand why the 3310 was big because, I don't know with you, but with all my mates, the 3210 was the one. 
Uh, I, I was a 3310 boy. You're a 3310? Yeah, snake 2 for well, the win. What is it? The 402s as well and 702s. We used to have those before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They were all great phones and uh, there was a lot of cool little hacks and cool things you could do on them. I remember uh, changing the message centre number so you could use engineer's lines and get free text. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you could go in the settings and change everything. And even like, my girlfriend had the 3330 at the time. She, you know, that was the one that did like WAP internet browsing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she went, you know, I can look up train times on it. And it'd, it'd take like 20 minutes to get them well, downloaded. Actually, but... Nostalgia Nerd's done a nice little video on the uh, WAP browsing as well. He has, yeah. And he, he, amazingly, he uses like Vodafone's WAP service and it's still active. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, even says in this video, it's probably some like dusty old server in the corner and they're like, a lights appeared on it. Who's ringing that? Yeah. They, they were good, but they weren't as hackable as the Eric, Ericsons. You used to be able to do wiretapping on them, which is ridiculous. But it's like, I've still got my original Nokia 3310. And, you know, for that video I did, I found, found a charger for it in like a box of wires that I've got. Still charged up and like, you know, it was probably about two weeks ago I charged it. It's still, the standby battery's still there. It still comes on. I guess they're kind of good for zombie situations or stuff like that, you know. Or I, I remember years ago, I left my 3210 in a friend's car. And then two weeks later, I rang it and he picked up and it was still on. Yeah. You know? Well, they've kind of become, the 3310's become a bit of an internet meme, hasn't it, in recent years? It's like, because I can see why the kind of trading on the, you know, the history of that kind of a name that's become iconic now. Mm. But really, this modern handset, apart from bearing the same model number, it hasn't got anything in common, really, has it? No, no. But I, I guess people are looking for that kind of robustness and that uh, functionality like. I remember my friend actually dropped his outside school and a bus ran over it. Yeah. And it was fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You just change your case on it, yeah. can you? <laughs> you couldn't see that happening with an iPhone now, could you? They're going to be selling this new version of the 3310 for um, 49 euros. So, you know, $52, which I guess, it, like you said, you know, if you just want a, a burner phone, people call it, don't they? Or something that's going to stay on. You can keep in your car, for example. Or yeah. it, Someone did make a good comment on um, this article that I've been reading here that it'd be good for companies... You might just want their employees to have a simple phone that they're not going to download millions of apps on and be on Facebook with it all day because apparently it can do, like, you know, there is apps for it it's Android, but it's only got, um, it's not even 3G internet, it's 2.5G, like Edge. Well, it's interesting because people like hospitals and stuff, they need, they still use pager services. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of places they can't really have that much signals going on. So, you know, it could be used there. Then again, for 50 quid, you could just buy an original off eBay for half that price. So yeah, true. That's what I do. <laughs> so uh, it is nice to see the Nokia 3310 name back, though, after all this time. Yeah, and they're very good at marketing as well, because it's been absolutely everywhere. Oh, I can't has. believe it. Who'd have thought Nokia would be making the headlines again? Yeah. <laughs> now, the N64, obviously, legendary console. Um, I remember over Christmas, you know, we were at uh, Joe's house party, weren't we? I've got oh, Joe yeah. back on, actually. Not been on for a while, has Yeah, it? doing that garden eye. Yeah, you were playing Goldeneye, weren't we, on the N64? Loads of fun. Yeah, we need to get Joe back on, sorry. He's planning a wedding, though, isn't he, at the moment? Oh, He's God, got yeah. all boring. Uh, but did you know there has been an unreleased Nintendo 64 game found this week? And it's Die Hard 64. McLean! Oh, my God, <laughs> I love this. Um, you Yippee showed me the link earlier. Yeah. And it's it's got no enemies. It's just you walking around the base. Uh, the music... Funky, yeah, yeah kind of golden eye star. It looks very much like golden eye, I think, and it plays like it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, totally. And there's a, a kind of quite a long video of it, and it's based in a prison. But you know, the whole feel of it, it looks brutal, and they've got dual wielding guns as well. Yeah, you know, it looks really cool. Well, they're saying this game was going to be out in 1999. That was the original plan. And um, there's a guy on Assembler Games, a forum member, who's um, actually come across. Uh, this unreleased prototype of it, and apparently this, you know, this game was never shown to the press. There were a few mentions in like news articles at the time in magazines that you know it was in development, but no one's really ever seen it until now. So this guy's come across it, and he's actually uploaded a um, yeah a YouTube video showing about 15 minutes of gameplay on it as well. Yeah, it's saying you know it's kind of been split into three ROMs, yeah. so each ROM's got about eight levels. Yeah. And three of them are playable. But they've got no enemies, so it's just literally walking around the levels and shooting glass and stuff like that. What this essentially is, because I mean, obviously 1999, it was kind of pretty late in the N64's life, wasn't it? Um, and that was the reason that it was canned, apparently. So they did actually move this project over to the Game GameCube, and that was um, Die Hard Vendetta. Now, obviously, you know, it was an all right game, but it wasn't a huge hit. I think this would have been a lot bigger had they released it. Oh, yeah, and I love the Die Hard games, like, you know, Die Hard Trilogy on the mm -hmm. PlayStation. Oh, my God, that was amazing. <laughs> 
But now you can, if you want to see this game and uh, download it and play it on em- emulators, uh, we'll pop a link in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Experience Die Hard in uh, all of its N64 blur vision glory. Yeah, and check <laughs> out that amazing beat as well. Yeah, and a bit more. Yeah. Like, you can download it at home. Put it, put it on your phone. <laughs> now, we've covered a few legendary things in this week's show. The Sinclair C5, Nokia 3310. What about one of Atari's most epic games that they released back in the day? Have you heard about Sword Quest? Now, I've heard that there was this kind of epic adventure game called Sword Quest, and they did a competition in it, right, where you could win a sword or you could win your name in the game or something, and that's my vague details. That's about all I know, Dan. Well, this was in the early 80s. Um, So Atari had this... um, It was to win real-life money. So you'd have to play these puzzle games, and this kind of like, you know, uh, a comic book came with it as well. And the comics featured, like, the clues to the puzzles in the game. Oh, cool. And the person that solved it would win the contest, like, that round of the contest. And the prize is valued $150,000 in real life. Wow. So there's meant to be four games in here. Earthworld, Fireworld, Waterworld, and Airworld was going to be the last one. And each one had kind of a a real-life prize. It was, like, you know, encrusted with jewels and stuff like that. It was like a crown, a chalice, I think. But the last one never got released, Mm. Airworld. Because by that time, um, Jack Tramiel took over Atari. And they couldn't afford all these uh, expensive goods. Yeah, I mean, he was like, you know, obviously very tight with his money, wasn't he, Jack? <laughs> Infamously tight. And uh, the Airworld game, they were meant to receive a Philosopher's Stone, which was meant to be like, you know, a r- really big diamond encrusted bit of jewellery, really. You know, had the emeralds on there, rubies, um, that would have totaled up to $25,000. Wow. Now, that never got released, and no one ever knew where the Philosopher's Stone ended up. Now, AVGN did a video on it a few years ago. He predicted that Jack Tramiel had it hanging above his fireplace or something, was, was a legend, but... <laughs> Doorstop. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, obviously, you know, Jack passed away, didn't he, a couple of years ago, and there's not really been anything heard about it since. Yep. So quite what happened to the original, you know, Sword Quest prizes, no one really knows. But it turns out, 30 years later, Sword Quest is back. Oh, Kind of. You're not going to win any expensive prizes this time. What it is, actually, it's, um, it's going to be a series of Sword Quest comic books. Now, the idea is, <laughs> this is pretty cool, actually. So it tells a story of a guy called Peter Case. Now, Peter is apparently, you know, he's a, he's a Sword Quest super fan. He was obsessed with those games. And uh, with the last one, never seen the light of day. It crushed his heart. He had to move back in with his mum. So he's depending <laughs> on winning these prizes like he's paying for his life. And then he re- rediscovers all his old Atari stuff again. So that's essentially the idea behind these comics that are going to be coming out. Now, it's actually done by the team that have done the X-Men 92 comics recently. And um, the artwork from uh, a guy who did Batman 66. It's this really nostalgic kind of Marvel comic style. Oh, nice. That they're working on here. And um, there's going to be four different ones, obviously, you know, for all the different Sword Quest games that were meant to come out. Going to be 25 cents each, apparently. This This is really cool idea. I like how they're kind of... Everything's retro about it, and they're going back in time, but it's a modern comic, yeah. Ace. And I, I think, you know, having that legendary name Sword Quest on there as well, and uh, selling it for 25p, I mean, anyone who's into collectibles, Atari, even like comic books, going to run out and grab those, and, you know, they're probably worth as much as a yeah, Sword Quest. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be, like, Kindle versions and stuff like that as well, so. Yeah, well, it, I thought it's just really cool, though, isn't it? It's a nice little nod to uh, a little bit of, you know, gaming lore, a bit of history. That's amazing. Why don't they give out prices like that nowadays, Dan? Yeah. You know. I guess with the internet now, though, everyone just give it away straight away, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> and let's play the YouTube the next day, yeah. wouldn't they? You know what I mean? So. so if you want to find out more about those comics, we'll pop those in our show notes this week as well. Right, thank you so much for checking out episode number 60 of the Retro Hour podcast. And, of course, we're getting into, like, what, March now? Start of spring, where we belong to all the big gaming conventions and shows this summer as well. Yeah, and there's a, a few games coming out, so we might be getting some of those guests that have promised to come on yeah. when they're releasing their games to come on and talk about it. Ravi's going to be working hard over the weekend. Yep. <laughs> and speaking of amazing guests, let's get into this week's. Now, we're going to talk about the history of games like Riven and Myst, of course, game that changed the world. Here he is on the Retro Hour for the next 45 minutes or so. Robin Miller is this week's special guest. And we'll catch you next Friday. Ciao. You're checking out the Retro Hour podcast, and here it is in the moment we've been waiting for. Time to welcome our very special guest this week, Robin Miller. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Hello there. 
Now, um, before we get into stories of, you know, games like Myst that Ravi and I were both huge fans of in our younger days, we thought it might be quite nice to get a little bit of background on you. I mean, do you remember the first ever time that you used a computer? When did you first experience one then? I do remember um, Rand, uh, the co-creator uh, of Myst, of course, um, had me over. He had he bought all kinds of early, early computers, and he um, had me over to his house, and he had, um, I don't even remember the name of the computer. Um, I think it was a computer that I, Kirk <laughs> <laughs> from Star Trek uh, advertised. In from some very, very early computer magazine, um, the thing, you know, like had a, I don't even think it had a monitor. I think it was a Commodore um, VIC-20 advertised, wasn't it? The VIC-20. Yeah, it might be. It might be that. Um, so, you know, and Rand and I went to early computer conferences and we would, you know, kind of, we would g- g- gape o- over these sort of, you know, computers that they just looked so sophisticated to us. And um, I remember seeing an early laptop, wow. like what they called a laptop back then. It was a brick, you know, <laughs> now it was like this. Um, we would laugh at it now. But um, so that that early computer that Rand had, um, it was small. You know, it was a home computer. That was the first computer that I really before that, we had we actually had a game machine. I remember we had Pong at our house, and that was when I was that was when I was nine years old. That was amazing, um, and I have no idea to this day why my dad bought Pong. But you know, we would hook up to the television. It was this little box. You would have to put the plastic sheets over the TV screen to give it color. That's the only way to give it color because <laughs> it was all black and white. And um, that was like, you know, that was our first computer game. Were you into kind of puzzles and logic stuff as well when you were a kid? I was into art and music as a kid. There was a point where I I really was fascinated by Dungeons and Dragons. My, our, both of our, we have another brother, his name is Rod, and he was really into Dungeons and Dragons. We would sit in on those sessions I wasn't overwhelmed with that, um, but I was fascinated by how that game worked. What I wanted out of that was more and more strategy and less randomness. Um, and, I, and Rand and I used to talk about that, how it was such a random feeling game. Like, you know, we, you would roll the dice so often and that annoyed us. And we kind of wished for a game that was like Dungeons and Dragons and had that story elements of Dungeons and Dragons, but um, you were kind of a little bit more in control of your own destiny. So do you remember when you got your first machine then? When did you get your first home computer then to start experimenting? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was um, around the time we kind of uh, began the business. Rand contacted me and he said, hey, there's this thing called HyperCard. And HyperCard was... As I try to explain it to people, it was like a precursor to the web. It was very, very similar to the web, except couldn't connect to other people's computers out there in the wide world. It was just existed on your own uh, computer at your house, you know, and you could build things like websites, but they were just there on your computer. So he said, you know, hey, there's this thing called HyperCard. Um, it's like a construction toolkit. Let's make a children's book. And then we can, you know, ship out floppy disks and the people can read this children's book on, a, on their computer with little kind of active hotspots where you click on something like, um, you know, a character or something like that. And then that character comes alive or does something. So he sent me HyperCard. And the very first day I had it, I started drawing things. And um, I did this not on my own computer. I did this on my parents' computer. I didn't have a computer yet. And that was a Macintosh. But it was very soon after we started going down that road and um, making that first game, um, which was the manhole, and um, it it like it started selling. Uh, we realized, oh, this is a thing. It was soon after that that I got a, a Macintosh for myself. So, what kind of computer games were inspiring you around that time? Then, what were you playing? The thing is that the things we were making at that time, like the manhole and Cosmic Osmo, these early worlds we weren't really directly inspired i don't think um as far as i can tell um by other games that were out at the time 
Um, they were more like just these worlds that you kind of wander around in freely. We were, I think we really were more inspired by uh, children's books and, um, you know, movies, uh, uh, children's movies and, you know, Disney movies, things like that, because there just wasn't a lot. There wasn't a lot of stuff for kids. There really wasn't anything um, at that early point. I mean, it was really, really early. So, you know, I will, the one thing that was... There was Zork, yeah. and I remember seeing the Zork at an early point, and, and that was kind of interesting in that it was a world, and so there was an inspiration there. Um, but, you know, it was all text. So I remember I never even got through Zork because it held, it held my attention. I'm a very visual person, and so it held my attention for a little while, and then I got bored. And so that could have been an inspiration, like, you know, wanting that to be – wanting that sort of experience to be a more visual thing – uh, on a computer uh, was probably ins an inspiration to me. So what point did you decide a game was needed for adults? Oh, okay. So I, while we were working on Cosmic Osmo, we're building this larger... We, we built half the world that was released on... It was released on disc first. And then CD-ROMs came out. And we realized, okay, we can make this thing larger... Um, like much, much larger, and we can put music on it, and we can uh, extend the universe. And we did that. And we saw that people's reaction to this, and I don't think this was so intentional, but we saw that people's reaction to this was it felt like there was a real story in the universe, almost more than we had intended. Before I got into computer games, I was writing a novel. You know, that was like really what I loved. I loved films, I loved books. I kind of even fell into computer games um, unintentionally. And so seeing that people reacted to it, like, you know, they kept meeting this Cosmic Osmo character and they really felt like the world had this uh, embedded uh, char character and story narrative, you know, it, it was very fulfilling and it made us start to think like, okay, Now's the time where we could really write something with a more intentional narrative. And it could be not for kids, but for, you know, an older audience. We started to talk about what ideas, you know, we might have along those lines. And we actually proposed something to our distributor at that time, Activision. And um, we put together a proposal and, you know, we, our ideas were kind of... They were along, many of those ideas were along the same lines as Mist, it, but it just wasn't a great pitch. <laughs> um, they were probably smart to turn us down. Um, and I, I honestly think the technology for that wasn't quite there yet. I don't think it would have worked. But going from floppy disks to CD-ROM, I mean, CD-ROM must have felt like, you know, it was an infinite amount of storage. You went from like, you know, oh, 720 oh, kilobytes yeah. or one megabyte to like 700, 800 megs. Oh, it did. It did. Yeah. You, you literally to, had to like, at one point we had a game where it was, it was put a, a floppy in, take it out to continue playing, put another floppy in. <laughs> you know, take it out and continue playing. You know, but we had that again when we um, got to Riven. It was a fly, a five CD-ROM game. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we ran into that wall again later on, um, even though CD-ROMs were supposed to be so huge. You know, you hit that wall again and again and again, it seems, no matter what happens. And so when DVDs came out, and it was just, it seemed like that happened so soon. We released Riven for CD-ROMs, and then almost immediately, it seemed, uh, DVDs came out, and then we were able to release Riven for DVDs. One thing about CD-ROMs was when they first came out, it was a lot of kind of just data dumped on there, like, um, you know, early encyclopedias Ooh. and stuff. Right. Oh, I remember. It's like there was this technology, and it felt like, you know... There was a lot of different technologies that kind of came along all at one time. The CD-ROMs, there was HyperCard, which was a good medium for CD-ROMs. And it was, but no one really knew what to do with it. And soon after there was um, QuickTime. And, but all of these things were kind of like, okay, okay, this is great. What do we do with all this stuff? I feel very much like we're 
in that same place now with virtual reality. And we just see like all of this stuff thrown at the fan now, you know, and that's how it felt very similar back then. Like, okay, what do we do? We have all of this technology. What, you know, let's put it, uh, like you say, an encyclopedia. <laughs> no, we, no one really knew what would work. I remember when I first saw Mist, it was on um, we had a, one PC at school that had like a CD-ROM drive on. It was one of those early CD-ROMs. You had to put the disc in like a caddy. Um, and one speed or something. Yeah, one single speed, single speed. <laughs> didn't even have a tray. It was like, you know, archaic today. But I remember seeing the game though. And again, it, it blew my mind just seeing the amount of space that you had to work with. And those graphics as well. I mean, you know, you never really got anything like that on a floppy disk. Right. Yeah. What software did you use to do those renders then? How, how did you get them looking that good? Um, that was um, Stratavision back then. And, you know, those graphics back then were really amazing. Now it's almost like you look at them and they pale in comparison to so much that's out now. Mm-hmm. And Stratavision was this one program that it was, a, it was like – it blew my mind when I ran across it. It was like I could make three-dimensional imagery on my Macintosh, and I couldn't believe it. And when I first came across it, and we, we first decided, uh, we first realized we could make Mist, and um, we were going down that road, I, well, I knew I was going to be doing it uh, by hand, like doing all the graphics by hand, drawing the graphics like we had done our previous products. Because I didn't think Stratavision at that point in time could do entire islands. So I started like trying to create graphic styles for the islands by you know just drawing them. Mm-hmm. And um, and I was working on all sorts of things. I was like pulling my hair out trying to come up with you know things that were sophisticated, looking much more sophisticated than our previous products. and and then I just thought, you know, I'm going to give this a try and see if I can, like, create an entire island in these products. And I was able to come up with a method that, that, that worked in it. In it. And I achieved that. At that point, you know, I realized, oh, wow, we can make this three-dimensionally. And that was such a breakthrough. How long did it take to do those 3D renders, though? It must have took forever on that technology to do each single, like, frame. Yeah, and that was so... It took hours for every frame. In a way, it was was annoying <laughs> a little bit, more than a little bit. Um, but it was also um, gave us the feeling, the like, we would, I would build. I would build and build and build, and everything I built was in wireframe. Like, I couldn't see anything I was building. And that includes, you know, textures and lighting, setting up, you know, um, a spotlight here or, you know, um, you know, the overhead lights or the ambient lights. And, you know, so uh, the interiors and everything is always just in wireframe. I wished I almost that had filmed kind of the process back then or, or recorded more of what it was like just for posterity's sake. But then to render it, I would have not really much idea what it would end up looking like. And it would be, you know, six to to eight hours to see a single image. And it was like looking into then this other world and getting being the first to get a glimpse into this other world, which is a very amazing moment to, to be like the first person to get this glimpse into this other world. But I remember yeah. I, I used to do some 3D rendering then, and like, you know, mm-hmm. I'd like a Commodore Amiga, and I'd like try and do a teapot or something. You'd have to leave the computer on for like two days before you saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. I know it. I know. And some of our stuff would take, yeah, some of our stuff would take 12 hours, 16 hours, some of the more complex stuff in this. Um, but, you know, we tried to like, you know, for example, on Mist Island, if we took a shot that was aimed toward the library, we had to hide everything behind. You know, I would just select all of the trees, all of the architecture, everything that was behind that shot and, and, and hide it all because otherwise it, it just couldn't render the shot. So anywhere you were looking, that was the only thing that was shown in that rendering. The worst part about it, this is the worst part about it. At one point, I had set up the renderings for one entire island, um, and this was Channelwood. 
and I had rendered them all out. This was right near the end. We were hitting all of our deadlines. You know, it had taken so much time. Our, I was not making backups at this point, stupidly. And the computer, uh, the disk drive crashed and I lost every single image. Um, and we had to then re-render all of those, that imagery. It was like, you know, it was right near the end of the, the product, the project. And so I had to go back and um, I had at a point two computers on my desk and I was just like, all I was doing was going from one computer to the next, setting up uh, renderings. And, and it, was, it was good because I could set up things to render one after the other and then leave um, them overnight. But all day long I was just like setting up these uh, images to render. It, it, got pretty, it got pretty crazy. How kind of uh, risky did you guys feel entering the CD-ROM world at the time? It never occurred that it was, to, to me at least, that it was a risky venture because we were so thrilled that we were able to make the game. You know, I, I do, I think we were pretty confident it was going to make, I mean, I, we never felt like it was going to be the hit that it was, that it ended up being. It just never occurred to us. But we, we felt like it was going to, we had a job and the job was making the game. I mean, we were doing our dream. We were working on a, a game and um, it, it was an amazing, amazing opportunity. So it just never really occurred to me like, oh my God, what's gonna happen when this is released? That's, that's never been my mentality. That wasn't my mentality when we were working on Miss, Mist. I mean, the, the bigger risk was when we were working on Riven. We really had to turn around and we put a lot more money into Riven and there was a lot more expectations and a lot more riding on it. And probably stupidly, <laughs> I didn't even feel that way when we were working on Riven. Because again, I just felt like such a privilege to be able to be in that position to work on a game like that. You know, it's an amazing opportunity. It was an amazing opportunity. I remember playing Mist really early on, and um, you know when you you first obviously start the game, the graphics were the first thing that you notice. Like we've mentioned, those amazing renders. But then after that, you get into the game, and it, it's very atmospheric, and you kind of get this sense of like isolation when you're in that world as well. I mean, was that kind of intentional? It was more intuitively iso uh, intentional. We didn't set set uh, down beforehand and say, okay, let's make this thing feel. Let's make the player feel isolated and give them this feeling beforehand, you know. Uh, but what we did do is we started work on it. We saw how the renderings were feeling. And we thought, oh, this is nice. This feels good. Let's, you know, increase the mist level. Let's, um, on this next world we're going to build, let's go this direction a little bit more. Because this is a very powerful feeling that we've just built into the first world. Um, so, you know, when we build, you know, uh, Channel Wood Age, let's go this direction again. So it was a process rather than something that we just in the beginning planned out from the get go. Um, we were a little as, as designers, we were a little bit more innocent and intuitive and worked a little bit more. You know, as we went along, um, we improvised a little bit more our way through it. We didn't have a whole lot of time, and we we only had a couple months up front to plan the entire thing. We made things up as we went along. We had to. And so a lot of that visual design got changed and rerouted as we went through it. One thing I noticed about it is that, it, you know, the game didn't hold your hand. There was actually some pretty tough puzzles in there, wasn't there? Yeah, definitely. And that, too, changed. Um, because we actually, um, in the beginning of it, the beginning of the game totally was different, uh, in our original designs. In the beginning of the game, we didn't hold your hand at all. And we set it up in such a way, um, where you were dropped on the dock. The way we had originally designed it, people couldn't figure out anything. And there was, if you remember on the dock, um, maybe I'm getting into such detail, people will never be interested in this, but... If you remember, on the dock, there's a little door that goes down into a chamber. Yeah. 
um, where Atrus talks to you. Well, that was never in our designs. That was a result of our testing. It was almost like that was an inciting incident that we added to get the game moving. And there was also a note that was left on a path that you're walking as you're walking up to the library. That was also added as a result of testing. So there was these things that we we had to add after we started playing the game, play testing the game. And people just like, they had no idea what to do. And we realized, oh my God, we haven't really um, pushed the player in any direction. We've got to go back and, and redesign some things. So we did. Well, um, one thing I really liked about Myst was the books in it. So, you know, you kind of had a linking book at the beginning and there'd be notes, you know, it's a game where you had to do a lot of reading. Yes, yeah. And we didn't know how much, you know, people were going to read and we didn't, you know, I think we designed it in such a way that the only thing you really had to do was go through and look for the pictures <laughs> and find those and, you know, use the puzzles, figure out the puzzles. But then we wanted to make it so that those, the rest of those narratives and things you read were like, you know, they were interesting. I felt it really um, helped the kind of narrative and the kind of idea that you were going to a fantasy land that, you know, a book opened at the beginning and you kind of were transported there. I thought that was really nice. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And the whole thing is based on, you know, tr a transporting through books to other worlds. And, you know, it just seemed like it was absolutely necessary. You go into a library and then you're, you're reading these books. And, in fact, one of the things we, we did about halfway through the creation of the world, actually less than that, we, were, we started designing and we realized, oh, my God, this was in the very beginning, before we had started production, as we were designing, we realized we need a history to this place. And we, we started the creation of uh, the history, and that helped us so much as we were designing. That was one of the things that, you know, we were able to work into those books, we were able to then, it, it created like the whole larger, you know, epic, mythos or mythology of um what became you know mist riven and and then everything else after it um do you think it kind of helped open the world to cd-rom to the general public you know get it in more homes and oh yeah i definitely do there was a point where people were like going out and buying computers and learning to use uh mice that you know, people had never used computers before because, and, and Mist was something that was very unintimidating for people who had never used computers. And that was, we were hearing stories of that all the time. Um, so definitely CD-ROMs. Definitely it, it pushed CD-ROMs, um, CD-ROM market. It was kind of a crazy time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when the game was released, though, and obviously you must have started seeing all these really positive reviews and when it started selling really well, I mean, when did you realize just how big it was? Um, well, it came out on, on Macintosh's first, and the sales just skyrocketed. And that, that really surprised us, and we were not prepared for it. And we didn't know what would happen on the PC, in the PC world, and we started, there was a clamoring from uh, PC users and they really wanted it and we um, like we didn't know what would happen and the PC version was in preparation it was being prepared and they're just we weren't doing any pr uh, press we were doing a little bit of press but we're, there wasn't any ads or wasn't any real marketing and um, then when it was released there uh, for PC users it just like it exploded the point where I realized that um, it was a, a thing that was a phenomenon was or that first point, I think, where, the, where it kind of blew up with the Macintosh users. And then when it had its like second wave, which was only a few months later with, it, with the PC users, I, was, I didn't even know how to respond to that. And I, you know, it's still this many years later, I st like it was just inducted into the science fiction and fantasy hall of fame. And I, I'm still kind of blown away by that. And then there's small things that happen all the time. Like, okay, this is something uh, I just saw someone created a mist Lego Island, huge, a huge Island they built. That is like, it 
proves to me that mist is a part of pop culture. And when when the thing that you've created is a part of pop culture, it's bigger than any, than it's become bigger than, um, life. It's, it's like larger than it's, um, certainly larger than its creators. So I'm, I'm kind of constantly blown away. Well, um, Miss stayed number one all the way till 2003 when The Sims took it away. So that shows how popular it was. Yeah, it was yeah. a mm-hmm. massively long period of uh, staying in the charts. Right, right. Uh, I mean, again, that, when it stayed number one for that, that amount of time, I was just like, this is crazy. This is insane. This, you know, I, this is just absolutely insane. And there was all these kind of different milestones that just kind of have really... Um, astounded me and that was another one like wow and a lot of it has been just because it was a thing that came along at the right point at the right time you know I think some of it was because we created something ahead of the technology we didn't create something for the technology at the time we were looking a little bit ahead like there was these and like I I was mentioning before there was CD-ROMs um, you're, we were kind of crazy to build something for CD-ROMs. Nobody had CD-ROMs at that point in time. It was stupid of us. We were we built something for full motion animation. There wasn't full motion animation. Nobody really had that yet. Um, QuickTime hadn't even been built yet. We were there was all these different you know, technologies coming from different places, and we built a little bit ahead of that. And then you know we released it and. All of that kind of came together. Um, so if we did anything right, it was looking ahead a couple of years and building for that. And, you know, it's not something that everybody wants to do. You want to kind of build for what's there right now. And But we were willing to kind of say, you know what, let's, let's just look down the road a little bit and let's build for that. That was the smart thing that we did. Well, following up, the biggest PC game in history at that point must have been... A pretty big task then. I mean, when you started to work on Riven, did that feel a bit, bit over, overwhelming then? Did you feel like you really had to live up to the first game? Well, we had some disagreements inside the company. About that. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, yeah, personally, I felt like we, we can't possibly live up to that. Let's just try to make, you know, the best game possible and, you know, do our best to make a very beautiful, you know, uh, thought-provoking game. Let's not try to make you know another mist or something that looks like mist or feels like mist. Let's make something that is new um, and feels new because that's mist felt new. Let's make something that feels new that is a sequel but really pushes the boundaries again in terms of visuals and story and narrative. Um, yeah, there was there was definitely pressures. But we, it helped that we were in Spokane, I think, because, you know, we were a little isolated and we could go after what we wanted to do and try that and do our best. And without the sort of pressures bearing down on us continually, we were also, um, for the most part, paying our own way through it. We had uh, economic independence, which really, really helped. Well, I hear you um, did stuff to help the kind of ultra-realistic graphics, like uh, take textures from a native Indian settlement in New Mexico and stuff like that. Not, I want to make clear, was it native Indian settlements? It was um, just from things like, you know, uh, we, went, we did take a trip to Santa Fe, but we took photographs from just around Santa Fe. I think that's been built up um, more than actually took place we we did take a trip to santa fe that we took photographs from like a gazillion different places we put took textures from all over the place more than the the textures i I think the important thing about riven that was a real change was just the design we really really took time on creating a design that stood out And sometimes that doesn't, people don't notice, like, oh, this is such great design. And they shouldn't notice, like that huge dome and all of the geometric shapes and the bold, the bold shapes that, that 
were throughout the island and, you know, just like things that didn't necessarily exist in Mist and suddenly were in uh, Riven. Like the uh, animated sequences, you know, going down the mine shaft and stuff. Right, absolutely, yeah. So it wasn't, you know, even though we did have a team of incredibly talented artists and they were uh, giving it their all, we also wanted um, design and then implementation of that design. And so that was our real, in terms of the visuals, that was our uh, a real interest in, in Riven. And then... On top of all that, we were really attempting to get narrative implemented as well throughout everything. What lessons do you think you learned from Mist when you were making Riven then? Well, it's interesting because, you know, I learned lessons from Mist about what, you know, we did wrong, about doing things. I, 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 I felt like we did things wrong in Mist. And then I, after doing Riven, I felt like, oh, okay, well, we did this wrong in Riven. Um, and boy, we, it was done better in Mist. Um, and I felt like that was why Mist, to a certain extent, was uh, a, bit, a larger success. Um, but Mist, some of the things, like um, I feel like puzzles, to a certain extent, in certain areas, were pretty arbitrary. I don't think people enjoy that. I think there's a lot of games that are very successful uh, with puzzles that are arbitrary. And, um, but Myst is not the kind of game that should have that. Myst is the kind of game that is a story, a narrative game. Um, and it's very much based around these two brothers and this father. And you know, you're, you're working through and you're trying to figure out what is the story. It's like you're a detective in the game trying to decipher this larger narrative. And if you're in the middle of that story and you come across some puzzle that's entirely arbitrary, it feels out of place. It feels like this doesn't belong in this world. Mm -hmm. You know, I shouldn't hit a maze and then just have to figure my way through the maze, like by just mapping it out on a piece of paper. That doesn't belong in a world where I'm where there's this these this narrative. And we did that in Mist, and it was it, it was out of place. It was just it, it was totally wrong. And that was because of our because we didn't know any better. And so when we got to the point where we did Riven, we made the decision like, we're not doing that. If there's any puzzles in Riven, they're going to be a part of the narrative. They're, they're going to exist and you're going to feel like they're not puzzles. You're going to feel like you are working your way through this world, like you're a person there and if you're figuring out something, you're figuring out the world as it exists in this greater story, you know? And so we really strove to do that. And how do you do that? How do you design something like that? It's, it makes it harder to design that. It makes it much harder to design that, but that's what we strove to design. Were you a bit disappointed that it wasn't as big a success as Mist? Um, no, I mean, I, I never expected it to be as big of a success in, as Mist. I mean, Mist was a phenomenon. I think a lot of things came together. I do think we could have made Riven be a better success, but you can't really tell that unless you've looked back on a thing after you've finished. And, and, and then you can start to realize like, oh yeah, we, well we did this, we made mistakes here. And then you go on to the next thing and you can, you have that knowledge. But you do your best, you know. Um, so after Riven, I felt like, you know, the I did feel like the mist, I had always felt like there would be mist whatever story we would tell in terms of the novel and then Riven and then th that would have been what I would be interested in in terms of the Mist saga. Well, despite the fact that Riven was well received by, you know, fans of Mist and the series, um, you had no involvement after that, though. You actually stepped away from the video games industry after that game. Why was that then? There's a couple of things. I really wanted to uh, tell story with Riven. You know, that's what I wanted to accomplish. Um, and I thought we could do that in the, when we started out. I thought that it was possible to achieve that. And we worked through it and, you know, we got about halfway through Riven and I realized, you know what, we're not going to be able to achieve this. As, as much as we put into this environment and we were trying at every level to put story into it at every level, whether it was staging and 
um, you know, visuals or, you know, um, uh, the puzzles or the characters or, you know, just whatever you can think of, you know, trying to create um, a believable narrative. It just felt to me at the end of the day, like, you know, this is kind of story in a game ends up being in any game. It ends up being um, kind of laughable. And here we were busting our asses trying to make it, trying to make something really great, and it's not working. Um, and it's got, I got really discouraged at that. And I, I still pushed, I pushed through and I made this thing as great as I possibly, possibly could. And, but then I, um, I decided I don't want to make games <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I want to make something where I can I can actually work on narrative. Yeah. Um, and I I did. I stepped away and I started working on film. And that's a whole different story. I do feel now all these this many years later, um, especially with the virtual reality. First of all, I've come to some realizations about story and games. Secondly, the technology has changed um, and advanced. I, I feel like story is not a matter, it has nothing to do with characters in games. I think characters in games are still laughable. Yeah. Um, but I feel like story is all about environment. And looking back at, say, Riven, I think we did a, a pretty decent job of environment. And I think it, it actually, the environment does tell a story. When I play a game, I am so connected to environments. That's when I leave, they kind of um, get under my skin, the environments get under my skin and stay with me, and that's what I want to get back to, and that's, I, that, that's kind of what I get obsessed with. So I feel like that's what tells the story. You know, that's, the environment is the character. It's the main character. Besides the player, which is maybe the other main character, um, there is the environment. And if there's a way to tell a story where that environment really becomes an active character, then games can really, really be powerful. And I think some games have achieved that. Um, so that excites me. I think games have evolved to a point where they've begun to really excite me. And then I think virtual reality, that combined with virtual reality, has really, it's done enough to get me excited about getting back into the game, so to speak. <laughs> so, so are you, you going to be making a return to games then, are you saying? I'm, yeah, I'm making a return to games. I'm, I'm actually working on a game now. Wow. I've just started, and, I'm, and so I'm designing some things. And um, I'm in the early design stages. Um, and so, yeah, I'm doing that. And it's for uh, room-sized uh, VR I think that's the future. And again, I feel like, you know, it's not something that at this point people have in their living rooms. But I do think, uh, I, I feel again like it should be something where we should be designing for the future. And I think it's a few years down the road, but I, I feel like it's, I think it's coming. Will we ever see a VR version of Mist? I don't know. I think we probably will. That's something where, you know, we have to ask Rand that. Because if there's one game that would be perfect for that, you know, you know, missing yeah, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I suspect so because so many people want it, mm -hmm. and it's still I in their so. imagination, yeah. you know. Yeah, and and I have talked, I've talked to him about it before, and he says he's told me so many people want it, and um, so he just has, you know, he continues to hear that. At one point, he and I were talking about a like a an entirely new version of Myst. And, and in fact, we were like headed down that road um, and had designed some things. And then he um, decided to not go that direction because so many people are desiring uh, an entire, or desiring just the, that old version of Myst. Well, when can we expect to find out more about your project then? Is there any way we can keep up to date with it? I will be, I will you know as soon as i have enough to announce i will announce it and it shouldn't be that much longer i, I will definitely announce it very soon excellent well robin it's been fascinating getting your stories you know like I said ravi and i huge fans of miss and obviously chatting to someone that was behind a game that you know literally changed the world is 
just very humbling and incredible. So we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us this week. All right, yeah, thank you. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, really enjoyed that. And if people want to keep up to date with you, have you got a website or Twitter people can go to? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, Tinselman. Where's that name from then? <laughs> oh man, I have had that connected to me for so long and I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Um, maybe I was just looking for something available on Twitter. I don't know, uh, but it's uh, it's it's around. So yeah, Tinsel Man. You know, if if people follow me there, and I, I'll definitely announce whatever I'm working on uh, there. So, well, let's hope you do the same to VR as you did to CD Room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you yeah. so much, Robin. Thank you. This has been really fun.